So looks like there are no new participants today. Okay, uh, all the participants have been in the past sessions. And if that's the case, I'm not going to spend too much time in the introduction part. All right. Uh, so my name is Jay. Uh, so uh, you can, my name is Jendra Kumar. You can call me Jay. And uh, I have close to 10 years of work experience and uh, in data privacy, cybersecurity, and information security. And have in, uh, certifications including CIPP, CIPM, uh, and FIP regarding data privacy, and also have CISA and CSA star from cybersecurity domains. So, just an introduction on different certifications which are available, which I've uh, discussed on all the past three sessions. So, uh, you can always uh, ping me, you can connect me with LinkedIn as well. Uh, I have always kept my LinkedIn ID, which is Jendra Kumar space R. You can connect me in LinkedIn as well. I will just applications which are available in uh, IAPP. So CIPP E is about uh, information. Uh, it is sorry. It is about the data privacy certification specific to a jurisdiction. There are different laws. Uh, one is GDPR, which is the CIPP E uh, European Data Protection Law. We also have different variants, which is US, uh, California, uh, sorry Canada and Asia. So the, there are the four different variants. So why should we go for CIPPE is because uh, that's considered as a gold standard in the market and uh, it really helps a candidate to understand how uh, you will interpret a legal requirement and apply to your office environment. It's one of the very important foundation element of building a data privacy career. CIPM is a Certified Information Privacy Manager course. So this speaks about how do you uh, uh, handle day-to-day -day operations of a privacy program management. So this is a very, very important course which will elevate your profile to leadership and uh, uh, how to uh, how do you become a data protection officer. CAPT is a uh, technology-related uh, certification. It uh, helps you to embed data privacy by design requirements, right? User says can't hear. Okay. Uh, is it better now? I have not done anything. Hopefully, it's maybe at your end. Just kindly check that. Uh, so, CIPT is a course which uh, is about how to embed data privacy by design into, uh, into te technology so uh, solutions which are used by the organization. And it's a very interesting course if you are uh, targeting to be a technical person uh, who is already into uh, CSSP and other domain, this also suits your uh, requirement. But if you are experienced more than seven years, six years around that time, I will always recommend you to go for the combination of CIPM and the CAPPE because CAPM is one of the equivalent of CISSP and CISM in the market when it comes to data privacy, all right? So that's a very uh, 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 sought out uh, certification in the market. So this is the difference between us uh, and any other uh, provider in the market. So uh, we, we provide 32 hour session, which is a clear differentiator uh, when you look at any other uh, player in the market. Uh, generally, they provide 12 hours or 16 hours, but all the 32 hours from our end is uh, live training. And uh, so we have ample time for every participants to uh, discuss the questions. And they also have, have a lot of time to go back uh, after every week. You have two, you have four sessions, four weeks with eight sessions and uh, it's spread across a one month time. So after every week, I'll be sharing a lot of materials for you to go and read and come back with questions and discuss and then move on, all right? So this method is very, very important because we are studying a legal subject and we're gonna focus on CAPPE, right? Uh, so this, is, this has been working wonders and success rate has been amazing uh, because why we chose 32 hours? Because when I did my course, I definitely knew that a candidate cannot cover this topic in 10 hours or we cannot do justice when we do this training for 10 hours. So that's the reason we have pushed it to 32 hours. And it, it was definitely a lot of time from our end, but it, it, it has a lot of uh, a practical uh, value to the candidates who are taking this course. Uh, so we provide guaranteed lowest, uh, lower price to uh, whatever you can check in the market. We will definitely be lower than that an approved and certified instructor with FIP. Myself, I'm FIP and I also am a approved IAPP instructor. Uh, career oriented and skill-based course. So you'll see a lot of practical examples coming through the course and uh, our curriculum is definitely molded towards uh, how do we implement on uh, data privacy requirements on our day-to-day -day operation perspective. 
uh, with this package you will get iepp ebook and uh, you ebook is official textbook and uh, you will also receive the participants guide which is the ppt which we will be discussing during the session and you will also get an exam voucher plus a uh, one year iepp membership this is sort of common to any market player uh, what we will be providing extra is that uh, we will be doing a case study approach with a lot of practical case studies will be provided for you there are templates and other useful resources which i will include from time to time for different topics there is a dedicated exam strategy session and we will i will be supporting you on your post completion of this training for your exam uh, in terms of discussing on the q and a if you need guidance in terms of how to when to choose your exam date and how to uh, I'll be assured uh, I'm ready for the exam, so you can always have those discussions with me, and also be helping uh, people who ever are transitioning from their careers in terms of data privacy. Uh, what's what? How how should they mold their career? And for the young people who are just uh, passing out from the college, I'll always be there to help you out in terms of one of the things you need to do. And uh, one thing I'll make it very clear: uh, we don't give any uh, placement assistance. And if there someone is saying this in the market, uh, just be aware of it because uh, as as I've been saying it for a lo long time, uh, placement is something which you should earn, and uh, it will it will come to you when you are rightly equipped with the knowledge and with the with if you can uh, uh, give the confidence to the recruiter that you can perform the role without even a hands-on experience, right? So that's something which you should definitely build upon you. And don't expect organization to find a job for you. It may not suit you in many a case in terms of your expectation, package, location. A lot of factors are there, right? You need to compromise a lot of things if people are just giving a, a sake of uh, placement assistance, right? It's better you find your opportunity, and there is not gonna be a dearth of opportunities. There is gonna be a lot of opportunity uh, which is there uh, in the market, and especially when the law is gonna be passed, there's gonna be so many openings in data privacy. We'll see eventually for the next uh, six months to one year. So let's get started with uh, our content today: supervisory and enforcement. So there are different styles of enforcement. There is a self-regulation and there is a regulation by citizen and there is an administrative uh, all set. It is accepted in the market. It's just that authorities are not accepting it. Still have no education approved. Yeah, that's 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 okay, but uh, uh, they don't want to uh, support any particular education. The reason is they want to keep it agnostic, right? The moment it has been recognized by uh, the authorities, then they will start claiming that they are biased with a particular certification, right? So they generally authorities always try to keep it agnostic, Mr. M. All right. Okay, so uh, there are different styles of enforcement, and uh, so the first one is a self-regulation. The second one is regulation by a citizen, and third is by the authorities, right? So we will be looking at uh, uh, these three with different examples, and uh, this chapter contains a minimum of two questions and a maximum of four questions. So uh, in today's session, I'll uh, focus mainly in terms of administrative uh, uh, supervisory enforcement, right? Uh, before we jump into this, uh, since someone asked, I will also give some example for self-enforcement as well as uh, regulation, uh, regulation by the by the citizen. Some user after certifying on CAPP, what is the ideal time? Uh, just a second. After certifying on CAPP, what is the ideal time to get certified with CAPP? Immediately, right? If you if you have a good CAPP knowledge, it will help you to clear the certification even within next one month. So that other day, that is, uh, you can take up, even you can do parallelly. I have seen candidates who have enrolled for both the courses and they're doing it back to back. If you do CAPP first, doing a CAPM is almost like another 30 days of maximum time you need to do CAPM. Uh, with the certification, which one is more active or valuable industry? I shouldn't answer this question, uh, Umayt, but uh, as per me, if you ask uh, my personal opinion, I would say CIPM uh, along with CIPPE combination is the most valuable courses in the industry. The reason is uh, they have been much before than CDPC came into the market. Uh, so I had uh, so th there are a lot of people who have CDPS here all through grandfathering scheme. So grandfathering scheme is like once the certification came into uh, picture, so they offered it to many people. I also had the chance of taking it up since uh, it was new to the market. I didn't pick it up 
So CDPAC will gain momentum maybe in the future, but currently CAPM and CAPP are the ones uh, which which has a maximum repetition when it comes to certification. All right. So will we get notes on the classes you are taking? I have been asking this regularly, Mr. Vishal. Uh, you will get the participants guide, Vishal. So uh, whatever content we are discussing during the session, actual session, right? Uh, when you join my course, you will get the participants guide, which is the actual PPT we will be taking. So don't worry, you need to take down notes, but uh, I'll be sharing a lot of practical use cases and other things which you need to keep in your mind. Uh, so that is taken care. In terms of notes, you will get something called a participants guide. That is the actual content we will be discussing during all the four weeks. So you don't need to worry about that, Vishal. So you will get the notes. Hope that answers your question. So when we uh, when we do when we say self-regulation, right? So we discuss something called accountability requirement in the previous chapter, right? So accountability is a very important requirement for all the uh, entities. Uh, which are uh, which are bound by GDPR requirement. So part of that, you need to appoint a DPO. Uh, if you fall into those triggers, you need to maintain the records. You need to have policies, procedures defined. You need to conduct DPIAs. Uh, so uh, you also need to uh, have security by design requirements. So these are uh, some of the important uh, uh, accountability requirement, right? And also, uh, uh, you need to ensure you have a proper international data transfer instrument, right? So this all falls under self-regulation, right? Ensure that uh, you don't expect uh, someone to come and question you. Uh, either it could be a data subject or it could be uh, the uh, enforcement authorities. But you yourself be uh, uh, active in terms of ensuring that you are compliant. So that is predominantly self-regulation, but this is not taken lightly by organizations since there is a heavy penalty which is associated by the breach of accountability requirement. Organizations are uh, 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 effectively proactive when it comes to GDPR compliance. So they don't wait for the citizen uh, or the sorry, no, data subject or uh, the supervisory authority to come and question them, right? because it cannot be built in one day. The GDPR compliance, uh, people try to buy, buy some solution and just say we are GDPR compliant, but GDPR compliant is all about your practice and a culture of the organization. It cannot be done in one day. So that's the reason uh, you need to really start before. It's a case for even the Indian PDP bill, DPDP bill. So uh, if you are in a, in a role for implementing data privacy in your organization, you need to start. Don't wait for the last date. Uh, the, the law will obviously give time for compliance. It could be six months, one year, or two years. Uh, so don't wait till the time uh, you have to start now because ingraining data privacy and protection part of your process will take time. People need to uh, accept that. Yeah, they have to embed it as per the day-to-day -day, uh, working style. There are a lot of requirements that needs to be done. Data discovery itself could take three to six months effectively. Effectively, uh, if you are a large organization, right? So uh, that is something which comes part of your uh, self-regulations and uh, regulation by individuals. So when I say regulation uh, by uh, individual, it comes in two categories. One, as an individual, uh, you can pursue compensation against a controller or processor if you suffer any material or uh, financial loss. Uh, from non-compliance, right? So this is a regulation. Since you can raise a data subject, right, and if it's not getting answered, uh, that is one way you can reach out to the authorities, uh, questioning that uh, the controller has not responded to your data subject, right, which is a direct violation, right? And uh, if there is a data breach, and uh, the data breach results uh, in terms of a material loss or immaterial loss, loss as well, like uh, for example. Uh, the distress that is caused by the breach, then you are eligible for uh, a compensation. It could be uh, it could be a number based on the level of uh, uh, impact you had as an as an individual, right? So controllers and processes can also defend themselves by showing that they were not responsible for the event. Uh, so there could be situations. These these lawsuits are very common in uh, uh, Europe and US as well. Uh, so people take litigation cases very seriously, and uh, so they they fight tooth and nail for such cases. In many cases, uh, people are awarded uh, compensation, and uh, there were a lot of recent cases. Even uh, distress is being counted as one of the 
uh, important element to avoid some material compensation, right? Uh, so that's something which is important. Uh, and also, you are allowed for a representation, right? If you have heard about the organization NOIB, N Y O B, so it is uh, the head of NOIB is Mr. Max Krems. So he was personally responsible for invalidating the uh, previous two European Union and the US uh, uh, data privacy agreements, whatever they had for international data transfer. So you can use provisions in GDPR, have representative, uh, people, representative action. So uh, regulation allows individual to be represented by NGOs, known as civil society organizations and uh, privacy advocates. So representation can be big of a single individual or a group of individuals, right? So that is something which is uh, which is happening quite a lot uh, in the GDPR regime. People who are not uh, uh, who are, don't have that legal background or people who do not have the strength. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, time to fight such cases can be uh, can approach an NGO to fight for them. So these are uh, provisions which are available for regulation as a citizen. And uh, finally, uh, uh, supervision by the uh, authorities, right? So when I say authorities, there is a governance mechanism which is established uh, within GDPR, all right? So who will be, there's a question, Mr. Umed, who will, who will be accountable in case of a data breach occurs resulting in a loss? Is it CIO or a DPO? See, in general, it should be the company. It's not the CIO or a CEO or the DPO, right? Uh, but generally, the heads of the company are accountable and liable in most of the cases, right? So, uh, in my in my view, data protection officer is is. Uh, bound by certain legal requ uh, requirement and DPO is not actually liable for the mistake as a single person is rep uh, responsible for the uh, whatever breach that happens, right? So generally the CISO is responsible for the information security and there is a breach, then obviously his head is gonna be rolling out there. But if there is a, a breach on the GDPR requirements apart from a breach, then obviously the data protection officer is liable to answer. But uh, as I said, liability comes with uh, your seniority in the organization and generally the organization is responsible in most of the cases and uh, generally they have uh, liability insurance is also uh, signed by the top people uh, to protect from them in in case if someone uh, the company or any any other case they want to sue them personally so that is also something which i have seen a case right uh Tuba, I'm not changing the slide because my slide generally is going to start with the point number three. I'm just trying to cover point number one and two, which was not part of uh, my agenda. Said someone started asking questions, particularly about how we're going to cover in certain areas. So I thought I will uh, cover those topics. All right. So uh, when it comes to administrative supervision and enforcement, there is a governance mechanism which is established in GDPR. Uh, so there are 27 member states and each member state has a data protection officer. Uh, sorry, I'm saying data data protection authority, all right? So there is a DPA, data protection authority, and they, we can also call them a supervisory authority. Uh, both means the same. And uh, so they, they take care of the data protection uh, decision in terms of uh, uh, authorizing a code of conduct, authorizing a certification mechanism, uh, looking into investigation, providing consulting to the organizations within the country, right? So all the 27 uh, data protection authorities are uh, a part of a group called European Data Protection Board. So they, they are all represented by, uh, uh, they, they are governed by an institution which is on top of the DPA, DPOs, DPAs, which is EDPP. Okay, which is European Data Protection Board. So what is EDPP? EDPP comprises all the 27 data protection authority and they choose their head. And uh, so EDPP is, uh, is, being uh, is a successor of a previous organization called WP WP29, which is Working Party 29, all right? So Working Party 29 was uh, a, a formation, uh, organization formed under the previous version of GDPR, which is called as 1995 directive, all right? So why we are discussing this? This is all about the governance mechanism within GDPR, all right? So how does uh, action taken uh, when there are, when there is a particular breach scenario, 
okay and it impacts multiple people across member states right so in this case how do the responsibility be shared how does a uh, overarching decision is taken it's a bit a complicated uh, complicated topic we need to understand it very clearly all right so uh, i'll explain that uh, for example we have one entity right and that entity sells car, sells uh, sells car across different member states but there are 27 member states so let's take they sell they sell car across 10 member states which are basically 10 different countries within the europe correct so uh, in that case every country have their own authority and uh, every authority have their uh, powers defined by the gdpr right but there is a breach in that company and uh, uh, because of international data transfer it could be any reason and uh, the people are data subjects are affected across different countries right so in this case how does uh, gdpr have created a governance mechanism to deal such cases right so this is what we're going to see in uh, topic number 3 right in terms of how the governance mechanism is embedded within gdpr and uh, how to handle such international data transfer cases all right so let's move on to this topic which is what this diagram about okay so uh, just don't look at the diagram right now uh, it will not make any sense for you right now uh, i'll explain how the process works and then probably if you uh, see the diagram it will it will definitely help you to uh, get this clearly all right so i gave this example uh, one entity is established in more than one member state and there is a breach scenario right so in this case every supervisory authority will try to do an investigation correct and uh, each authority will come up with their own verdict saying this is the impact and uh, these are the provisions which we have breached and you may be liable for such penalties right and uh, since penalties could be a bit of subjective case and also uh, uh, there are different authorities different countries there's so many problems for the companies which are uh, which are going to do uh, uh, international businesses right so it's going to be a big problem for facilitating the business transactions within the european union uh, it will be a showstopper for companies even thinking of doing uh, business across europe correct so that is why they created a mechanism called uh, one stop shop mechanism one stop shop mechanism means uh, uh, if you are a company who are doing business across multiple member states and if there is a uh, in, there is a, whenever there is an international data transfer breach situation or a transfer case uh, so there is a concept called lead supervisory authority. So what is lead supervisory authority? We know there are supervisory authority for all the 27 member states, correct? And uh, there is no, there is no one authority who has been appointed with this role. But uh, the lead supervisory authority is a virtual designation who is. Uh, it is it is actually elevated virtual position, which means uh, for a certain triggers. Uh, a particular country supervisory authority will be elevated to the role of lead supervisory authority. We'll, we'll see them uh, one by one, what are the triggers and why uh, a lead supervisory authority will come into picture. So the same case, let's take to the uh, car uh, company example. And uh, so there is a, there is a uh, situation where the company is under breach and multiple people are affected let's take an example of france germany uh, uh, italy and spain there are four countries and uh, four countries data protection authorities are going to do the investigation right so in this case there could be different verdict and it will have a different impact on the organization it has multiple subsidiaries right and uh, when lead supervisory authority kicks in uh, as i said whenever there is an international data transfer breach and transfer issues lead supervisory authority comes in because of one stop shop mechanism so they take a unified decision and for that the company will be responsible for uh, uh, accepting the uh, penalties and they will be looking into the compensation part so that is when the lead supervisory authority comes into picture but how does it work in practice is what we are going to discuss right now okay uh, the same example the four countries are involved here and there is uh, each country will be looking into the uh, scenario and they will be trying to assert their position okay and uh, that is called assertion of lead supervisory position right uh, so how do you identify that whether this country uh, 
sorry this uh, supervisory authority will be will be deemed as a lead supervisory authority there are triggers through which you will identify this particular phenomenon right so for example the car making company has multiple subsidiaries but it has decision making that happens in headquarters okay let's take it's a german company with its headquarters in germany right so in that case the german supervisory authority will assume the role of lead supervisory authority okay so there are four countries which i said all of them might be asserting their uh, uh, assertion for becoming a lead supervisory authority but uh, the gdpr clearly says that where does the processing date the whatever data processing which has resulted in the breach where is the decision making happening right it doesn't need to be even in headquarters sometimes right uh, the actual decision making place is the indicator that where the super lead supervisory authority will be selected in this case germany is the uh, place where all the important decision regarding the data processing activity was decided right so germany will assume the role of lead supervisory authority right so why it is important uh in terms of assuming this role because once you assume a lead supervisory authority role you have certain powers again vested in gdpr right so there are uh, different procedures will kick in and uh, that's when uh, someone asked this before as well in terms of urgency procedure and other things all these procedures will kick in uh, because of the subsequent action will be taken by the lead supervisory authority right uh, we'll discuss them one by one for example Uh, there is a situation lead supervisory authority has been uh, ascertained in this case germany uh, supervisory authority will be the lead supervisory authority so he will uh, uh, he or she will be investigating uh, the case and uh, all the other uh, subsequent authorities which is the uh, spain uh, uh, italy and uh, the, uh, the other country which were i gave an example all of them have to work together right and uh, in this case after all the deliberation they will be issuing a decision okay which is called uh, uh, issue, uh, which is a issue uh, which is a, a decision issued by the lead supervisory authority so this decision the other authorities who are involved in this case have two option okay one they can accept this decision or reject this decision okay so when they accept this decision this will become a binding decision if they don't accept this decision they will give a recent objection reasoned objection which means they will say that we are not okay with this decision for point 1 2 3 4 they will say their objection due to the points and uh, if it has been accepted by the lead supervisory authority he will revise his decision and then again refloat it as a uh, lead supervisory authority decision if it is uh, if it is accepted by the supervisory other supervisory authority then it will become a binding decision but there is a possibility that the lead supervisory authority's decision will be again rejected and it becomes a deadlock situation right so when a lead supervisory authority's decision is not accepted by the other supervisory authorities then uh, edpp which is the uh, other uh, the, the governing body which is above the data production authorities will kick in and their decision in these matters will be the final binding decision all right so this is this is the entire procedure if you see uh, in this flow chart this is what happens uh, so there is a complaint which is initiated by the data subjects or it could be initiated by the supervisory authority complaints can come from both the direction uh, can be a suomoto uh, complaint raised by the supervisory authority or it can can from the data subjects the data subject have multiple ways to uh, uh, raise a complaint they can go to the entity which is the controller they can go to the supervisory authority or they can go to the core directly as well uh, they have three options when we are if you are a data subject you have all these three options open for you and in this case uh, so even if you go to the supervisory authority or the court possibly the investigation will open up and uh, there is a lead or non lead supervisory authority will come into picture so then assertion will happen as i said in this case and uh, finally the lead of authority will come into the picture right so for the lead supervisory authority when he takes a decision there are two options one it is either jointly agreed upon or it is not jointly agreed upon okay so when they are jointly agreed upon that becomes a binding decision 
and if it's not jointly agreed upon then there are subsequent action will be taken but in each of these case all the parties which are basically the supervisory authority and the data subjects will be informed right uh, so when the decision is finally agreed upon the parties are informed if it is not agreed the adpb resolves any disputes which is the final uh, flow of it when i say non lead tracked it may be a case of a particular country right uh, so which doesn't involve a, a lead supervisory authority concept so this is the two parallels that lead supervisory authority will come into case when the breach scenario involves more than one uh, member state and non lead uh, uh, channel will open up when it is for only a uh, 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 entity which is only within that particular country right so the the flow is almost the same uh, but when it comes to the concept of lead supervisory authority these these are the different governance mechanism which are embedded now uh, someone was asking the different procedures which are available in terms of uh, acting uh, in terms of supporting this i'll not be going into the depth because uh, each of them are uh, have to be discussed in detail since we have a lot of topics to uh, discuss i'll just give you uh, from uh, a quick brief in terms of what you need to know especially someone asked in terms of a uh, urgency procedure so urgency procedure is uh, let let me first start with a uh, uh, few more procedure which you need to know uh, so there are uh, there are three to four procedures which are uh, defined under the gdpr governance mechanism one is in terms of supporting uh, 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 the lead supervisory authority during the uh, decision making i think this is called cooperative procedure and uh, we also have uh consultation procedure and then we also have a urgency procedure there are three to four different procedure which has been laid out in terms of handling such uh, uh decisions all right and uh, so when it comes to uh when it comes to this particular uh, case of urgency procedure so when there is a situation when you need to uh, urgently react there is a situation when uh, uh a data subjects there's a risk to the data subject based on the type of breach and the data subject needs to be uh, protected or there is an urgent decision is to be taken you cannot involve in this entire governance mechanism because for example if you initiate such an inquiry uh, if you ask the other supervisory authority to respond under your cooperation procedure right and uh, so cooperation procedure means then there is a timeline defined for response uh if there is a minimum time there is a, a, a minimum time can be given and a maximum time is also defined under gdpr they may take 30 days to 60 days to respond to such questions coming from the lead supervisory authority and after that there, there is a due process which is followed to take a decision right so in certain case of urgent requirement then the problem will kick in uh, that uh, how do you take a decision when there is a uh, uh, there is an urgent situation right so that is why urgency procedure is there urgency procedure are temporary decisions which are taken and they are valid for 3 months until after 3 months the same decision has been accepted uh, by the due course of procedure whatever we have laid out part of the governance otherwise uh, it's a temporary decision which is taken for uh, time being that is the urgency procedure right uh, someone asked the question about cooperation and consistency mechanism cooperation is in terms of how the other uh, authorities uh will be uh, required to support an investigation support a, a particular scenario in terms of response to a queries uh what is the timeline required uh so these all falls under your cooperation mechanism consistency mechanism means uh there are two three examples i can give you for consistency mechanism decision taken by these uh, authorities have to ensure a consistent consistent application of gdpr right uh, uh for example there is there is uh, ad hoc contracts right ad hoc contracts are approved by the supervisory authority and uh, ad hoc contracts means a company wants to have a customized contract for international data transfer right so com company goes to the supervisory authority they 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 show the draft version the supervisory authority investigates and then they approve the ad hoc contracts but the same company is operating in more than 2 3 member states then edpb is the one which is european data protection board is the one which will give a final uh, uh, acceptance on your ad hoc contract the reason is if there is a scenario of 
uh, impact on more than one member state, there should be a consistent application of GDPR. So ensuring the consistency is a very important for, uh, uh, requirement of all the authorities, starting with supervisory authority and the EDPB, finally the European Commission. So this is the uh, requirement of consistency mechanism. Consistency mechanism ensures that the implementation of GDPR is consistent across all the member states. That was a main significant problem we had with the previous version of uh, European Data Protection Law, which is 1995 Directive. In 1995 Directive, uh, it was in the form of a directive, so it had an issue that it left the implementation uh, uh, decision making with the supervisory authority. So that had a lot of discrepancy when it comes to uh, interpreting the requirement and implementation of the requirement. But uh, now under EDPB consistency mechanism, whenever there is a case which is affecting more than one member state, definitely uh, the consistency mechanism will kick in in terms of ensuring that uh, there is a uniformity when it comes to uh, application of GDPR. I hope that answers the question, Chai. How does auditing happen with regards to the work performed by the DPO? Is it general, very specific, or do CISO and DPO in silos uh, work together in the same company? Is DPO responsible for implementing the technical controls like CISO? Tatatri, I think you are in the pursuit of becoming a DPO. I can see a lot of questions, particular to being a DPO. So, the work uh, done by the DPO is audited by, uh, again, in the same chapter, we have three different powers vested by the supervisory authority. Uh, so basis is that there is definitely uh, uh, inquiries can be conducted. So I'll, I'll tell those three powers which are vested by the law. The first one is called investigatory powers. So the authorities, which is supervisory authority or data production authority can uh, start an investigation based on a complaint by a data subject or if they are aware of such breach by uh, the media or uh, uh, by certain uh, information, then they can start an investigation by asking the controller or a processor to submit the records of processing activity, which could be starting with your uh, uh, privacy policies, procedures, and records of processing activity, ROPA. So basis these two documentation, uh, they can further conduct the second round of investigation, which could be uh, uh, particular to a topic or they could be, they, they can do a on-site audit as well. So it all depends on uh, the level of uh, documentation they have, right? So uh, they, there is a lot of uh, questions that can come, especially when you are, <clears throat> There is a breach scenario which you have, uh, which we have discussed in the previous class, where you thought that it's not a case of informing the supervisory authority. You need to document the rational, right? So all these things will be opened up when such investigation starts. So someone asked this question, maybe in the first or second class. What if I never inform the supervisory authority of a breach? As I told the answer before, you are riding your own luck. You never know when uh, uh, you will be under a breach, and uh, all your previous mistakes will will become a catastrophic effect on the company, right? So that is the first important powers vested uh, to the supervisory authority. Uh, this is your uh, investigative power. The second is corrective powers. Corrective powers gives the authority in terms of uh, 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 giving penalties, and they can even ask the uh, authorities, uh, they can ask the company to stop the processing activity or even shut down the uh, data transfer uh, process, whatever you have started. The third is consultation. Uh, consultation is whenever, uh, for example, we discuss in DPIA, whenever you are uh, uh, not sure about the residual risk and the residual risk is still existing after all the controls you have implemented, in that case, uh, you, need, you can go to the supervisory authority for the consultation. They will provide the direction in terms of should, I, uh, should we go ahead with the processing activity or not. So these are the three powers which are vested uh, to the authorities by GDPR. All right. So this is all about your chapter one, and uh, hopefully you all understand that I'm not covering every part of uh, the chapter because uh, due to we uh, due to the time, and as I said, we will cover this in 32 hours. I'm trying to uh, scramble everything within 32 hours. So I hope everyone appreciates that. Uh, so any questions on this? I hope I answered most of your questions. Let me see the chat. I think that a question was the last. I hope I have answered that question. 
is deeply responsible for implementing the technical controls like CISO. Uh, see, you have to work in tandem, Mr. Dattadre. It's not like uh, you will be uh, having your own privacy program, which will be standalone in the organization. As I said, you have to work uh, uh, in, in, uh, in tandem with the auditing department with the legal department, with the information security department. It's it's a joint responsibility. You need to embed the privacy part in the existing technical infrastructure. You need to make them understand what is a privacy risk, then create uh, a, a separate controls which is not there, or you can fine tune the existing control to cover the privacy risk which you identify to, with your risk assessment. Do CISO and DPO work in silos or working together? No, they work in together. They cannot work in silos. Uh, if they work in silos, that is a disaster for the organization. That's, that answers your question, Mr. Dattatre. So the next chapter is very much related to what we were discussing before, which is the consequence of the breaches. Uh, so infringements, for example, if you are under a data breach, what could happen in that case? A very, very interesting chapter. From the exam perspective, you get a lot of questions in this. Uh, so you get a minimum of two to four questions from this. And but it's a very you can hundred percent say you will get a question around these topics, which I'm gonna say the uh, uh, especially from the categories of penalties. Okay. Kashish say how are the fines and penalties applied to the public authorities different to the private ones? See, uh, it depends on the type of breach. Uh, the rule is common to public and private, but in terms of public authority, you have to see the accountability is much larger. And uh, generally, I can't go into comment because it's a decision taken by the supervisory authority, but generally private, uh, they are definitely scrutinized in a much larger way. And public authorities, uh, uh, we are strictly speaking from the European Union, but they are also considered uh, uh, highly accountable in case of a breach. Both private and penalty uh, public authorities are looked from a similar angle. And uh, it, there is a detailed uh, ADPP guideline which tells in terms of how do you calculate a fine uh, depends on the uh, kind of infringement. Okay, So in that case, public and private are the same. Uh, there is no different categories, but this is purely from the GDPR perspective. But when it comes to different laws, like even in DPDP bill, there are certain exemptions which could be there, which uh, can be given to a public authority. So it depends purely on the law which we are discussing. All right. So uh, there are two categories of penalties in GDPR. The first category is called uh, uh, the lower slab is 2% of your global turnover or 10 million euros. The the high slab the second slab is is four percent of global turnover or twenty million euros. Okay, so uh, in this case, what are the infringement that will uh, uh, attract which particular uh, slab of penalties? What a very very important important question uh, from the exam perspective. So generally, what I uh, uh, say to any candidate is that remember one slab clearly, and for that could be the the higher slab. Okay, so any violation infringement that disturbs the the foundation of GDPR, you most probably get a higher uh, highest penalty. Okay, so what are the foundation of GDPR? The principles of GDPR, the six principles which we discussed, right? And uh, if you if you violate any of the six principle, uh, so in fact with accountability it is seven principles. So if you violate any of the seven principles, you will definitely uh, uh, attract the maximum penalty. Okay. And second is data subject rights. The very reason of coming with any data protection law is to empower a data subject. If you are violating a data subject right, then obviously you are going to have the highest lab of uh, penalty. The third is international data transfers. If you violate the international data transfer because the data is going out of uh, the jurisdiction, the country will not have any powers in terms of containing that information uh, from leaking further, right? So this case is again a very, very serious case. And the fourth is, uh, for example, there is an investigation that opened by the supervisory authority and they are asking for you to submit documents or they are given some measures for you to do, but you are not obliging with those requirements, then this will also attract the maximum penalty. So if you remember this, when any other penalty will obviously fall into the second slab, uh, which is your 10 million euros and 2% of global turnover. 
So this is the trick I usually tell my candidates that do follow one slab clearly and remember the four important uh, uh, reasons, but these are not the exclusive, but in my view, if you remember these four, these are very, very important from the exam perspective. Usually the uh, uh, exam topics will be testing around the four important points that attracts the maximum penalty. All right. So we are moving into the second section of uh, the curriculum, which is called uh, application of GDPR. So the first chapter is, uh, so in this uh, four chapters, we are gonna look into how GDPR is applied on day-to-day uh, -day scenarios and how it actually affects us on a day-to-day -day basis. So we will be looking into four different versions of it. The first one is employee and employer relationship, which is, quite common topic and it's very very important as a data protection pro, uh, professional if you enter into any organization this is a very very important requirement uh, because you need to uh, whenever we say we have to protect data subject rights we always think customers but uh, th there are three different types of data subjects could be there in an organization data one is a uh, is your uh, obvious customers second is your employee third is your vendors so all the three categories of data subjects uh, data has to be protected by the employers right so when it comes to employee employer relationship there are certain very unique facts which you need to be aware of and there is something very very important from the exam perspective also i will discuss few things uh, this particular chapter will have uh, minimum three questions and maximum five questions when it comes to employee-employer relationship, one important aspect is uh, which lawful basis you can use to process uh, uh, employees' data. Uh, we generally use contract because as a as a as a candidate when we go for an interview, right? Starting from that, generally contracts the lawful basis which is used, and uh, after that we can use legitimate interest in few cases examples for example conducting a background uh, verification uh, to to do an employee monitoring schemes uh, do having a cctv camera to protect the company's infrastructure right so these are some of the examples for having a legitimate uh, interest uh, there there could be a case of using consent as well but generally Consent is not used uh, or seen as a valid uh, lawful basis when it comes to employee-employer relationship. The reason is, uh, you know, if, if we discussed before the attributes of consent, consent should never be uh, pressurized or forced by the uh, person who is, uh, uh, is collecting it, right? But in most cases, uh, if it is being collected by an employer from an employee, then it is not a freely given consent because in many cases it's a forced consent. That's the reason consent is not accepted in most of the countries as a valid lawful basis. Uh, but still, there is a possibility of consent as well. Uh, for example, in an organization, uh, there is a uh, there is an activity, external activity. For example, there is a webinar, there is a conference. So there is a photograph of all the employees taken in that case. And uh, if they want to publish that photograph in the website or in a journal, in that case, you can take a specific consent. Consent usually taken when it is away from the natural course of your employment contract. Only in those cases, you can take consent. In other cases, more, uh, mainly your employment contract will uh, serve the purpose. All right. Uh, so when it comes to goals of uh, workplace surveillance, there is a lot of important activities which you need to be aware of uh, whenever we do. I'll give you an interesting use case. Uh, we'll start with that and then go into the contents which are mentioned here. Uh, there was an employee uh, and uh, he was actually uh, using the internet to serve some of the sites. Let's take a social media website and he happened to click some link and then he was surfing along with the links. And uh, what happened is uh, eventually he landed in a page which is not accepted by the organization acceptable use policy and it violated, uh, he violated by uh, opening a website uh, which is actually not acceptable. So in this case, the employee was fired uh, from the organization and the employee actually went to the court demanding that uh, his firing was not a valid, uh, uh, is not valid because what reasoning he gave is that when he joined the company, he was not informed that his activities are getting monitored. 
uh, that he uh, whatever employee monitoring activities which is being created by the company is not being duly informed to the employee. So the court heard this case and uh, finally uh, it accepted that it is a valid case that the employee uh, was not aware that he will be monitored. That's the reason uh, uh, he was uh, actually committing that error. It's a human error, end of the day, right? Although his action is not acceptable from an ethical perspective, but uh, company rules has to be very clear, right? So whenever an employee joins an organization, there should be a clear onboarding notice which says what are the different employment monitoring schemes that happen. You need to take a, a, a part of acceptance in the employment contract, right? Including having a CCTV camera, monitoring your time and time out, uh, monitoring the employees uh, activities in the uh, organization assets. It could be uh, monitoring whether you're clicking a social media website or you're trying to uh, click a, a link which has been banned, uh, uh, which is blacklisted by the company. So there's a lot of things that comes part of your employment employment monitoring, right? So uh, this case is a classical example where uh, the employee uh, uh, benefited by uh, the organization not having a robust practices in, in ensuring that employees are informed the day they step in the organization, what are the uh, do's and don'ts and in terms of what uh, uh, data is getting collected from them, part of the employment contract, what are the activities which are conducted uh, in terms of surveillance, right? So. This, this is very, very important when it comes to employee-employer relationship. Having a, a detailed notice and informing uh, do, uh, uh, what data is collected from the employees. So goals of workplace surveillance is to protect the office assets. That's the reason I said it's a legitimate interest and uh, secure sensitive and corporate uh, uh, corporate information. Track your employment productivity and keep your workplace secure. What are the risk of surveillance? Lawsuits from employee, basically, if they are not being informed about it. And the second is reputation loss if the company is doing covert uh, uh, surveillance. What is covert surveillance? For example, there is a CCTV camera. Obviously, people can see there is a CCTV camera. But there are hidden cameras, which is possible. Uh, even it's valid under a certain special circumstances. I will I'll tell you from an example. Uh, for example, if it's a bank, and uh, uh, an employee has been suspected of doing a, a financial uh, uh, fraudulent activity and uh, the company wants to caught, uh, catch this person red-handed, what they can do is they can go to a law enforcement agencies and take the permission to do a covert surveillance, which means they can have a hidden uh, surveillance activity of what this person is doing and it, they don't need to inform about uh, this to the employee, right? So this is an example which is valid uh, to do such actions, but it has to be done uh, after taking appropriate approvals, okay? So in this case, there is a very interesting organization that comes to my mind, which is called your uh, uh, work councils, okay? Work councils are uh, 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 the organizations which are there in the European Union, predominantly in Germany and uh, UK. So these organizations have been vested power by the local laws and uh, the local laws give them power that in terms of any organization who are employing employee monitoring scheme, uh, they have to take the permission from the uh, this work councils. So they have power in terms of providing consultation. They even have power to stop entities from uh, uh, implementing such employee monitoring schemes. So they have such powers uh, in, in the European Union. So you need to be aware of these elements whenever you are transacting any European Union data subject, especially from an organizational perspective. All right. Uh, types of workplace surveillance, it could be video audio, which is your CCTV cameras, phone recordings, uh, which could be your mobile device management and uh, employee location tracking. Again, this could be done from your laptop as well as your uh, mobile phones. And finally, digital employee monitoring, uh, which can happen in many forms, which could be from your DLP solution, data leakage prevention solution. Uh, uh, it could be done from other uh, uh, sophisticated tools which are there currently in the markets, right? So six recommendation to keep employee monitoring legal, know what you are monitoring and uh, define who to keep an eye on, uh, set clear written policies, notify your employees, use dedicated software, uh, deploy next generation technologies, all right? So in this, the very important point is set the written uh, clear uh, policies and inform them and take their uh, approval part of the employment contract. 
another point which i want to bring it to your attention uh, uh, is that there is uh, whistle blowing schemes which are set up in organization whistle blowing scheme uh, would have been very famous after edward snowdon incident uh, which uh, which led to the which developed to the european union and us trade agreement getting cancel right uh, which is a safe harbor uh, subsequently the uh, the second version uh, which uh, which also got invalidated so this brought the uh, whistle blowing scheme very famous so whistle blowing scheme also is very uh, a sensitive topic because it involves a lot of personal data someone could uh, uh, create a false claim under whistle blowing or someone can create a genuine case of whistle blowing so you need to clearly define your rules regarding whistle blowing scheme and uh, you need to uh, clearly create the process which should not affect the whistle blowing investigation as well generally an ombudsman who is like a independent authority uh, away from the organization processing or influenced by the top management should be appointed who will be dealing such cases and lot of sensitive information and personal data will be collected during those investigation and should be uh, uh, should be cl clearly handled and such policy should be clearly defined all right so this is about in terms of employee employment monitoring so surveillance can happen in uh, different scale uh, so audio surveillance which is quite common for a very long time and uh, uh, we can we can group them under communication surveillance communication surveillance if i say if i can give you a very classic example has been existing for uh, centuries together because uh, we used to intercept the birds whichever was carrying the information and uh, do a mad in the middle attack uh, trying to steal that information is is a classic example of your communication surveillance right so communication surveillance uh, in the latest digital age happens via phone tapping or uh, listening to the voip which is voice over internet protocol or listening to the devices which is room bugging and latest is our iot devices which we, which we ourselves give a lot of information through alexas and uh, our googles so this is something which you need to be aware of and whenever we are doing certain surveillance activity which could be a legitimate case as well when it comes to uh, uh, for example law enforcement agencies can take a dual permission from the authorities and then they can do it because uh, that is clearly allowed in the law as well apart from that if you are doing any such activity then you are going to definitely breach as a private entity if you are doing such uh, surveillance activity unless and until is been authorized uh cctv which is a very common visual surveillance which has been employed by many organization right uh, so that is again used and you should be extremely careful when you are using in a private space for example at your home uh, where does your cctv camera is getting projected for example if your cctv camera is focused on your door and at not at the streets and if someone is trying to enter your home at it's perfectly acceptable you are using it to protect your home but at the same time if you are using a cctv camera which is uh, looking at the street in general then definitely you might be bounded by certain uh, requests that can that can come from the data subject for example uh, you are capturing someone's photograph or you are recording a video of a person who is walking on the streets and the person is not comfortable you being uh, you get uh, you recording him uh, him or her uh, uh, footages they if they raise this request you need to delete that information because uh, you don't have the permission to record someone in a public place until and unless authorized right so that is something which is very interesting uh, which you need to be aware of uh, in terms of what degree of surveillance activity you do uh, in terms of uh, there is a lot of factors also for example your zoom lens capacity are you recording uh, audio as well in terms of the angle and positioning of the cctv camera a lot of factors should be considered and you need need to be uh, you need to ensure that it has to be less intrusive as much as possible uh, so that you can defend if it is being challenged that is something which you need to be aware of uh, when it comes to tracking surveillance uh, actually the the image which is kept here is not exactly as per the uh, iipp uh, uh, elements which we will discuss in iipp course we will uh, discuss the four important surveillance which is communication surveillance which i discussed in terms of audio and the second is your uh, uh, video surveillance which which i gave you an example of cctv or drones right uh, interesting use cases when you are using drones 
how do we provide a privacy notice even for the sake of cctv camera right so uh, these are some of the practical aspects which we will discuss uh, i'll give you an example if you are using a drone uh, there are uh, suggestions given by the guidelines in terms of using a, a clear notice uh, in terms of signage saying that this area is under your drone surveillance or this area is under cctv surveillance and then you can provide a qr code for the people to just scan this and go through the notice and you can know who is the point of contact and how to raise your grievance and other stuff right so these are some of the elements which you need to be careful whenever you are using uh, such surveillance activity uh, we did discuss about uh the third category is biometric surveillance the biometric surveillance is predominantly used by the organizations uh and by the government as well uh biometric has multiple elements associated with this uh right from our fingerprints your palm your uh, iris retina uh there is a lot the big extent to what what actually qualifies a biometric uh, extent your uh, i i recently heard your body odor as also a unique template right so there is lot of element that comes through biometric templates one important question which is usually asked in the exam regarding this is uh, the photograph which we have does it fall under your sensitive personal data category uh, so the answer which is given in gdpr is that uh, any biometric data that can uniquely identify a person then it fits into the sensitive personal data category otherwise they fall into personal data category the reason is uh, there's a lot of video footage is taken by many public authorities right but all of those footages can never help sometimes they may they will not be help to identify a person uniquely right uh, so it depends on the quality of technology which you are using uh, in in terms of zooming and in terms of where you are positioned your cctv camera right so any such footages or photograph which can uniquely identify a person then that data can fall under the sensitive personal data category right uh that is your biometric surveillance and uh, we have more slides on this no so uh we also have location data which is for example uh, which is predominantly used uh, nowadays whenever we are using our swiggy zomatos uh, even google for that uh, whenever we are searching something a lot of location data is getting searched uh, by the implicit search whatever we search for example what are the hotels near me right uh, by the search definitely you are attributing your particular location whenever you are searching something your ip address is also getting tracked uh, so for delivering food your gps location all these things falls under your location based surveillance right so location based surveillance is something people are generally not aware but it has a lot of value to the organization to profile you in terms of uh, uh, identifying where do you belong and by that they can actually zero down a lot of uh, 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 profiling features right what else what else uh, these are things that comes to my mind google maps is again a very classical example uh even your uh, gps option which ever we turn on is again an example of location based tracking right so this is about surveillance and uh, the next chapter is direct marketing very very important and interesting chapter from the exam perspective is anonymous personal data termed as sensitive personal data the moment it's anonymous data uh, it doesn't fall under the gdpr material scope mr datadare uh, so uh, any data which is anonymous is out of gdpr scope uh, but pseudonymous data is part of the gdpr scope okay there is a clear distinction between anonymization pseudonymization anonymization is ensuring that uh, every personally identifiable uh, attribute is completely removed and ensuring that the data can never be reconstructed that is anonymization pseudonymization is temporarily removing the pi attributes and uh, keeping it in a different uh, place and uh, so it can always be reversed uh, with the with the management they can always uh, construct the tape, uh, data again so that is pseudonymization or uh, gdpr generally suggest uh, organization to follow pseudonymization so you facilitate business flow at the same time you also protect the customers uh, pi uh, getting disclosed with the larger uh, footprints in the organization i think we have this is the last chapter direct marketing all right so we are moving into the last component uh, last topic for today's session which is direct marketing 
there is only one more chapter left part of the employment uh, sorry part of the third section i will take that till tomorrow's and then we will move on to the section 1 which has three chapters section 1 is more of a history i'll try to pick up few questions to discuss tomorrow from uh, exam simulation perspective which we can do tomorrow all right and uh, so uh, there are minimum three questions and maximum five questions which you can uh, expect in this particular chapter so direct marketing is a very very sensitive and important field uh, for any organization because it it attracts a lot of eyeballs uh, uh, it's one of the areas which is usually inquired or audited by the third parties or for the data protection authorities the reason is it is usually found many organizations use very uh, uh, intrusive direct marketing schemes and they violate a lot of uh, compliance requirement so what constitutes a direct marketing is a very important and foundational question before we move on uh, so let me give you a news case for example a website is there it's it's having an advertisement or there is an advertisement on a, a public media like a tv channel or an internet wherever you see such advertisement those advertisements are not uh, uh, example of direct marketing. So direct marketing means uh, uh, a particular message which is crafted to an individual and uh, it is solicited only for that individual. Then, then that is called direct marketing. Direct marketing are targeted advertisement based on certain behavioral traits. For example, today if I go and search Amazon shoe, uh, uh, Adidas shoes, then I get an Adidas shoe wherever I, in the form of uh, uh, cookie, cookies, uh, I see an advertisement which comes through wherever website I visit in the day, right? So this is an example of direct marketing. So direct marketing is done. Uh, there is a huge uh, sector which is beyond the, behind this. There is a big industry which uh, generates revenue through direct marketing. So direct marketing is, uh, is falls under the lawful basis of legitimate interest whenever we do any legitimate interest based uh, processing activity we clearly understood that uh, there is a right to object by the data subject right so whenever we are using legitimate interest we need to be dually sure one uh, is it a valid legitimate interest so you need to do a sufficient documentation ensuring the necessity proportionality and adequacy and second whenever it's getting challenged by the data subject you need to showcase that it uh, overpowers it overpowers the rights and freedom of data subject and second you need to always provide a, a, a form of a form in terms of the data subject rejecting to such direct marketing at any point of time it includes at the time of first communication and also the subsequent communication all right so these are some of the important nuances when it comes to direct marketing there are different forms of direct marketing that can happen through uh, your email sms and mms which all falls under your digital uh, direct marketing there is fax there's location-based digital marketing there's online behavioral advertisement all that all are different elements of your direct marketing why we are looking into different perspectives here because uh, direct marketing not only triggers GDPR, direct marketing also triggers multiple laws and it's one of the very complex topics. It also triggers your consumer laws. It also uh, triggers something called e-privacy directive because the material scope of e-privacy directive and GDPR has a commonality in the form of cookies and uh, that's the reason it triggers multiple laws as well. So that's the reason whenever you are doing direct marketing activity, as a data protection consultant, you need to be absolutely, uh, absolutely sure in terms of what are the different legal and regulatory requirement and uh, ensuring the compliance of it. So regarding this chapter, there are a lot of practical elements which you need to look at. Uh, uh, there's a question from Srinivas. Can the organization retain the data beyond the retention period defined? So if you if you retain beyond the retention period, so the, the question is, can I retain the data beyond the specified purpose? Okay, the purpose is what defines the retention period. Uh, if I have to do so, it is a direct violation of your GDPR principle of storage limitation. So to do such cases, you need to again go back to the data subject and uh, request uh, for a exclusive consent or any additional processing activity. If you do such cases of retaining the data beyond retention period, which is beyond the lawful purpose, and definitely it's a violation. You can do it, but you will be violating the storage limitation principle of GDPR, Mr. Srinivas, all right? Uh, so in this chapter, we are gonna look into the different elements of, uh, as we discussed the different forms of digital marketing, right? 
and uh, it it as i said you have to different different channels have different opt in versus opt out consent requirements and uh, how do you actually communicate these requirements before uh, collecting personal data as well as sending advertisements right so this chapter is sensitive because people usually complain to a supervisory authority for receiving direct marketing people are often easily irritated when it comes to receiving a direct marketing messages so that's the reason i said this department is uh, highly sensitive and uh, it could open up the can of worms for an organization so this big since it is uh, directly interacting with the data subject we need to be extremely careful in terms of uh, what communication we send and uh, what is the lawful basis to send them uh, when it comes to direct marketing messages the lawful basis legitimate interest and uh, you should have uh, legitimate interest in in terms of ensuring for example i go and make an inquiry for buying a car in an organization i receive a direct marketing messages regarding the, the upcoming car launches then it makes it's a related advertisement it makes sense since the per, the person has agreed to receive a direct marketing message part of his uh, uh, interaction he would have consented uh, that's a valid case of receiving such advertisement but if you send an unrelated advertisement for example the same company also uh, sells motorcycles and uh, if you send such advertisement then obviously you are violating whatever terms you agreed in terms of uh, uh, sending the direct marketing messages so these are some of the aspects which are very very critical and also you need to provide a right to opt out at every possible communication there is certain list which is maintained uh, by the uh, in the U uh, european union territory especially in uk we called that as a robinson list i understand uk is not any more part of uh, uh, the european union but this is a very classical example uh, similarly such uh, uh, centralized list are maintained by many of the european union nation what is that list is called they are called do not disturb uh, directives so any countries which are uh, operating in direct marketing messages you need to ensure that your mailing list is verified against this do not disturb directives uh, uh, directories which are maintained and uh, ensure you follow the such compliances this is again a very important activity as a data protection consultant you need to inform the organization about all right um, the important question in this uh, from this chapter is in terms of what uh actually triggers material scope of e privacy directive and gdpr uh, as i said <clears throat> what is e privacy directive uh, so e privacy directive applies to uh, electronic communication service over a electronic communication uh, network for example any organization is doing a electronic communication using publicly available electronic uh, network which is internet or a telephone uh, services then e privacy directive kicks in so with this definition you can uh, 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 clearly understand that e privacy directive will come into picture when it comes to a digital form so mm -hmm. the questions in the exam can be in terms of can postal marketing even postal can be used for uh, uh, direct market uh, uh, direct marketing so mm -hmm. in this case it will only trigger gdpr but not e privacy directive you will get such questions in the exam uh so we will look into the different uh channels for example uh, postal we will be looking at telephone when it comes to telephone how do you collect the consent uh what what is the use case of automated calling system so automated calling system is another important uh, uh area which uh, gdpr highlights uh, obtaining individuals prior opt in consent to use calling system for direct marketing is is a is a very important requirement and uh, marketing by electronic mails uh, sms and mms you need to have a prior consent in gdp uh, uh, in e privacy directive uh, e, e privacy directive at gdpr lays out different requirements when it comes to direct marketing which you need to be aware of right uh again location based uh, marketing again in terms of uh, accessing a location data uh, through your terminal equipment which could be your laptops your mobile phones so you need to have a clear opt in consent so in this chapter uh, what is very important is for different channel what sort of consent you need for uh, gdpr and e privacy directive is what will be tested in this particular chapter